Today's episode of the DevEd Podcast is brought to you by Thinkster.io. With the rapid pace of change to front-end and back-end frameworks alike, staying up to date with your skills can be tough, but it doesn't have to be. With our expert-led courses on Thinkster.io, you have instant access to hundreds of courses on topics ranging from Angular, React, and Vue to Python, Rails, Docker, and a whole lot more. You can even customize your learning path to include any combination of front-end and back-end technologies that are relevant to you. Thinkster.io, a better way to learn. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the DevEd Podcast. I'm Joe Weems. I'm your host. And today on our panel, we have Preston Lamb. Hey, everyone. Jesse Sanders. Yo, yo, yo. Sam Julien, whose voice you may recognize. Hey, hey. Mike Dane. Hey, everyone. Luis Hernandez. Hola. And as I'm reading left to right, I get to Preston Lamb again. <laughs> and then finally, coming back to the beginning of the loop, there's Joe Eames yet again, but I look different than I normally look. Oh, um, that's Brooke. Yeah. <laughs> I just shaved, that's all. Brooke Avery. Hey, everybody. Oh, all right. We got a nice full panel. I like it. This is really the only place where I have friends. <laughs> <laughs> we like you, Joe. We like you. I could tell everybody, yes, I have, I have six friends. All right. So. Preston is marked as our special guest, although I don't know, how many times have you been on the podcast now, Preston? 45, 50? Yeah, close. Uh, this is my second time. So. Ah. <laughs> so he's our guest panelist, you might say. But today our topic is overcoming imposter syndrome. I'm guessing we brought you on, Preston, because you have mastered the tactic of... <laughs> you, you have no imposter syndrome whatsoever and never had to deal with it. You've always felt 100% like an expert in everything that you've ever done. So we'll be asking you questions about how to be confident in our, uh, in our work, I guess. I think this is a pretty fun topic to talk about, imposter syndrome, something that I assume everybody experiences from one time to another. Certainly, I do. So this is going to be the topic of our podcast today. I'm excited to get into this. Let's start off with I think it'd be fun to, to maybe go around the panel one at a time and require that everybody give a 10-minute dissertation. No, I think it'd be fun to go through the panel and just talk about when imposter syndrome has actually affected you in your work. So who wants to start off? All the time. All the time. It affects you all the time, Luis. There's 100% 100, 100 of the time, are, you, are, we, are we saying like literally 100? There's never a time when you don't feel imposter syndrome? I think I feel it all the time. Like I, like I, I have this nagging feeling of there's always a better way and I don't know what it is. Like I'm lacking some insight in the industry and everything I do. Even if it's something that I, like you, you will always find kind of a, a little bit of reassurance as you interact with other developers, you'll see that everybody feels that same doubt. But I can't help but feel like I know Joe knows a better way of doing this. I know Sam Sam, I'm going to talk to Sam because I know I'm doing it wrong. It works. And people are like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's the way that I do it. But I always get this nagging feeling that there is, there is something that someone else knows that I don't know and I could make it better. So you, you always feel that way. So when you're like speaking Spanish, do you ever think, boy, Joe could probably, he probably knows a better way to do this. I've got at least a 200 word vocabulary in Spanish. But most of that's by adding the letter O the sound O to the end of an English word, like Lampo, Desco, Chero. A lot of those work, though, <laughs> believe it or not. You say you experience imposter syndrome most of the time, whether you're developing, whether you're teaching, you're experiencing, you, you feel like you experience imposter syndrome pretty frequently? I, I think so. Um, I don't know if it's full-fledged imposter syndrome. There are some things where you feel a little more confident than others, but you still... I think you can't escape it. Uh, at least I can't escape it. There's always this idea of, you know, I don't know if I'm good enough to be doing this. I don't know if I am the right person to be teaching this. I don't know if I am doing this correctly as a developer. Like, but that's in my case. I don't. I don't know about the other panelists. I'd like to hear the other panelists. But I always feel that way. Like, I am not good enough. I am just lucky to be here. How did I get to this point without people knowing about me and discovering me, right? All right, let's, let's go around the room here. Brooke, what about you? All the time, yeah. yeah. Even back as an educator, because when you start working with people's children and they're constantly calling you out on best practices for how to learn and 
especially when it comes to things like learning disabilities or learning challenges, to try to be the expert on all of those is really hard. So I can definitely relate to it there, but then also just switching into development from education. Yeah, I, I mean, it's something I deal with, like Louise is saying, on a pretty regular basis. Um, you know, like at Thinkster, we work with authors who who are teaching on subjects across the board. So, you know, working with someone who's doing a course on Elm, for example, when I haven't even really been out of boot camp way that long myself, that can be pretty intimidating. So yeah, I mean, I've definitely had those moments where it's like, am I really qualified to help you when I don't really know the framework or the language that you're doing a course on? But that's where I've just had to buckle down and say, but you know, like I've had to trust my experience and my background and try to remind myself that my personal story, like my personal journey has taught me things that, maybe other people don't know. And so I've tried to just approach it in that way. And I hate the saying, but it's that fake it till you make it thing, you know? So, but yeah, I think, I think I, I deal with it a lot. All right. Okay. Preston, what about you? Yeah, I think I deal with it uh, mostly when I'm learning something new in my day-to-day job, at least. Or if I'm working on some part of an application and I've done that same thing a whole bunch of times, then I can kind of get over that feeling but especially when I'm learning something new, then it can be really hard to not doubt, to not doubt myself. And I remember specifically about five or six years ago, I started a job and it was kind of my second programming job. Um, I was almost done with college and it was fully remote and I was just learning Angular JS, and it was really hard. And there were uh, a few times where I thought, you know, I made a huge mistake. I went into computer science. I'm almost done with my degree and I can't do any of this. I can't learn how to do this. And how am I going to provide for my family and and all this stuff. And luckily I had uh, my boss at the time, he called me and he calmed me down and said, you know, everything's going to be all right. Everyone goes through these feelings. And so that helped a lot. But now, if I do things that are new, if I'm learning something new, it can be really hard to, to not doubt doubt myself, even though I should know by now, you know, I've learned a lot of new things. I should know that I can learn things. It might take time, but that's when it, when it really gets to me. Okay. Jesse, what about you? Oh, never, never. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Very, very much like what Louis was, Louis was just saying is um, pretty much every day. Like when I go to speak, when I go to um, present a class workshop or, or go do a talk, those feelings come up and, and, I think it's it's a, just a natural reaction. I have to remind myself a couple of things that people tell me, you know, told me in the past about like, you know, the, the audience is actually really pulling for you and, you know, pulling for me to do a, a good presentation. And, but uh, yeah, those feelings come up. I, I think a lot of it's um, anxiety, just being on the spot and in front of people and, and not wanting to be wrong or, or show people incorrectly. And, and uh, may, maybe there's a better way that I don't know about yet or, or something like that. So I think the other situation I was thinking about this while um, some of the other people were talking is that having been a consultant, I, I would often come up uh, with that feeling. Um, I would feel that that feeling come out when I go to work with a new client and I'm being faced with all sorts of new things that I haven't seen before and new, new ways of doing things and challenges and, and then feeling like, Oh man, am I the right person for this? And, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of struggling to try to understand like what, what was their intent here? How are they doing things? So the good news is, is that after 25 years, it's, it's still there, you know, um, still feel that feeling and, and uh, from time to time, but definitely when I get up on stage. I can relate to the consulting experience because I was, I've been working as a consultant for the last year and a half. And I think it's interesting because in some aspects, I'm an expert and I know exactly what I'm doing. But then in other aspects of the job, it's like I'm completely lost. And I do have this imposter syndrome because as a consultant, you're supposed to be the expert. You're supposed to come in and help and know what's going on. And in certain areas, I could do that. But then there'd be one technology or one framework that they're using. And and I would almost feel like I have to fake it till I make it to maintain that credibility, to maintain that like expert status. So for me, that's been a big one is like certain aspects of consulting is really triggers that in me. Yeah, I get that. 
Yeah, I get that. Did everybody on the panel respond? I didn't. Sam. <laughs> Sam doesn't have imposter syndrome. I don't ever. <laughs> I, I definitely have gone through a cycle with imposter syndrome where in the beginning I ha- I was like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. And then I went through that phase that most developers go through when they know a little bit and they think they know everything. And so then you don't have imposter syndrome. And then you really do start to know things and you're once again like, oh my God, I don't know anything. And I've, I've definitely found that the farther I get in my career, the worse my imposter syndrome gets because now I've got labels like Google developer expert and I'm like, I don't know how accurate that is. So I definitely have a lot of imposter syndrome when I like get up on stage and I'm about to talk about something. And part of me is like, what if I'm completely wrong? Like, what if somebody's like listening to this talk and like, who is this clown? He doesn't know what he's talking about. So I, I definitely get that a lot nowadays. Did you know that no engineer that works at Google actually has achieved the Google Developer Expert title? So apparently yeah, you you're better than every, <laughs> well, there's that, there is that fine point that there's they're not that allowed one, to. <laughs> that one part that you can't work for Google and be a GDE, but. <laughs> oh, geez. When you were talking about, you know, when you know a little and you think you know everything, I remember that. My, one of my first jobs, I remember learning something that no, none of the other developers knew. And I was like, whoa, I think I got this down. And then, you know, like a week passed and I realized how little I actually knew. And then, as time goes by, the uh, my number of known unknowns goes up far faster than my number of knowns, right? I just exactly. realized how many more things I don't know, right? That's the nice thing about being early on. You just think, yeah, there's only a couple of things I don't know. <laughs> All right, so is there specific activities that you do that are more likely to cause imposter syndrome? I'll just I've always found, anybody. I've always found teaching. I think Sam was touching on this before, like, you know, when you're teaching something, there is this expectation that you're an expert at it. And a lot of times if I'm making courses or writing content, it's like, I'll find myself second guessing something that I normally wouldn't because I'm like, oh, I have to be absolutely right on this. And then there's been times where I put content out and it has been wrong. And then, you know, I get an even bigger dose of that imposter syndrome. Like, wow, am I really qualified to be teaching that? So for me, it's just, I think teaching is a big one. I thought you just had to be one less than the head of the class. That was it. (laughs) <laughs> probably <laughs> you know the uh guy that was in uh, catch me if you can apparently he taught at our local university one semester a class on economics or something and he, he had no background at all whatsoever no qualifications but when they asked about it he basically said that he's like ah you just got to be one less than ahead of the class uh so teaching all right i get that i and i i certainly identify with that i get imposter syndrome a lot when i'm teaching what else what other uh, scenarios do you seem to find that you get imposter syndrome more frequently? I think just talking with friends in the industry and they will mention some technology piece that I've never heard of before. And I'm like, oh, maybe I should know that. Or why do you know that? And I don't, Uh, am I doing the wrong things? Am I studying the wrong things? So, So that happens to me quite a bit when I'm talking with other people that I don't work with and, and they may work with different applications and different tech stacks then I start wondering if if I'm doing the right thing or if I'm learning the right things or if I'm falling behind. Right. Conferences come to mind. Yeah. On conferences, yes. Um, because uh, if you're presenting, like some of you do presentations on conferences, I'm sure that's equivalent to teaching. But also, if you just participate in there, there are some nice nuggets of information that show up and you're like, where was I when this came out? How How did I not know about this? So you discover cool stuff in the conference, you should go. But just know that it will trigger a little bit of that uh, when you go to those conferences, just because of the amount of information that you get and such good information on the conferences that you're like, how did I, I missed it. And it came out and I missed it. I don't know about it. I didn't know. So you should go, but be prepared because it, it, it will trigger that on you. Yeah, I completely agree. It's uh I think about like being at conferences and then, you know, when the imposter syndrome really hits me the most is when I, I talk to somebody on the Angular team and, and, and it's like, oh my God, oh my God, they're, they're, they're so much smarter. They're going to see right through that. I actually don't know this piece that I don't understand this one concept. And, and um, I don't even know what that concept is right yet, but it's just that, that prefabricated uh, thought going on of, of, um, 
yeah, am I, who am I to talk to this person? This person's got, you know, amazing knowledge and, and, uh, you know, Hey, I might be a GDE as well, but you know, am, am I in the right place? Right. So that, that definitely comes up. And I think conferences, whether it be the, the Angular team or it might be somebody from Google or it might be a, like a really well-known speaker and, and, you know, get an, an opportunity to talk with them and, and that, that sort of feeling will come back up. I can definitely identify with that. I remember having dinner once for a speaker dinner and I was sitting across the table from an Angular team member and I had encountered recently some problems with something with Angular and I was like laying out, I was like, you know, in this particular scenario, this thing behaves this way and like, that seems like a major problem. Like it should be behaving this way. And he was like, oh, that's because in JavaScript, you know, this is how variables work. And it was like this very basic underlying principle of JavaScript. And I was like, Oh, right. Oops. Yeah, whoops. Sorry I bothered you with a, such a basic question. <laughs> I want to go back to uh, something you were saying about, um, not you, Jesse, but somebody was saying, talking about uh, talking with friends you don't work with. Who's that? Was that Mike? Press Preston? Yeah, that was me. That, that was Preston. Uh, when you're t- talking with friends, I, I, I think I want to skip ahead at the end of the episode. We want to talk about like how to deal with imposter syndrome. But here's, here's a tactic for dealing with imposter syndrome when you're in, in that scenario. Mention things they have no, about, no, no idea about. <laughs> <laughs> and I can highly recommend one technique for this, getting old. The older you get, the more things you've seen, and then you can start dropping references to things that don't even exist anymore, right? Like Fox Pro. Like, oh, yeah, we used to, I did that in Fox Pro. Ever heard of Fox Pro? <laughs> <laughs> and they'll be like, no, I've never heard of this. Well, that's because it died 20 years ago, but I just thought that was funny, right? Like, I get that as well. You're sitting around with a bunch of people, people you don't know or whatever. This happens to me all the time, actually, when I'm hanging out with Jesse. Because Jesse will start talking about super cool stuff, and I'm just like, oh, I know so little. Jesse knows so much. Oh, you're killing me, Joe. All right. Any other times when imposter syndrome, we got we covered new situa- teaching, right? Being around other developers, social situations, conferences. Is that, is that, is that those, those are the three that we mentioned so far? Any other situations that it seems like imposter syndrome comes up fairly universally? I would say just getting new jobs. New jobs. I was thinking of that same thing, like yeah. new jobs, promotions, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Anybody ever gotten a promotion to like lead dev or something, some new responsibility on the team where you're in charge of stuff and then got that? <gasps> Mine wasn't really a promotion per se, but at my last job, we sort of finished this project and the contractors were all done. And so when they left, I became the person in charge of the whole front end. And at that point, I didn't have that much experience. And I would, I would run into problems, at, you know, like with the gulp build or something like that. And I would ask my boss about it. And he'd be like, well, it's up to you now. You're, you're the guy. You've got to fix it. You, you own this application. And I was like, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to do any of this. It turned out to be good because it forced me to grow a lot as a developer at that time. Mm-hmm. And I got to do a lot of things that I didn't think I was capable of doing back then. Right. When I was 38, I got a new job, worked at Domo, and one of the main engineers was 21. I'm 38, he's 21, and man, he just, he knew front end like nobody's business. And I felt like such an imposter. The crazy part was like, he was so much closer in age to my daughter than he was to me, right? Like she was like 16 at the time. I just thought, this is crazy. This kid who's been like programming professionally for like two years knows so much that I don't know. All right. What are times that uh, you don't encounter imposter syndrome? I think for me, it's um, the size of the group. So if it's just like, if I'm teaching something to one or two people, it's it's more of a natural discussion. And I I don't feel that as much versus if you, you know, if I get up on stage and there's 1500 people, like it's terrifying at, at some level. So I, I think that the the size of the group um, for me impacts that as well as things that and someone mentioned this earlier is so things that I do every day that I'm that I'm working with all the time and just talking with people about that you know um, it might not even just be teaching it might just be talking and 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 having a conversation with them about hey how do you do this and and whatnot I agree with that I think the more you you talk about something or you know going back to teaching of that topic, like the more you've taught that workshop or that webinar, whatever it is, like you get better at it and you kind of 
hone in on what to say, what not to say. But I do think you have to be a little bit careful because if you get too comfortable, then you kind of do become an imposter in a way. Like things might change, they might get updated and you can't stop always tweaking it, I guess is what I'm saying. But I think for the most part, the more you do something repetitively, the better you are at it. I think for me too, it depends a lot on the expectations and you know where I'm, where I sit in the group. So if I'm hired as a expert consultant for something, I think I get imposter syndrome more. Whereas if I'm just talking with like developers on my team or my friends, or if I'm even just like in a class where I'm not expected to know everything, I think then the imposter syndrome is way less. So I think that the expectations that people have of me going into a situation seriously impact that. And if the expectations are low or it's a situation where I'm supposed to be learning, then I, I almost never feel it. I, if anything, I, I prefer not to know something so that I can learn it. Hmm. You know, something jumped out at me, something that Brooke said, and it's something that someone told me a long time ago. It said, uh, it, when we start getting into this comfortable zone and we stop feeling anxiety or, or whatnot, that really, to me, that's the moment. The moment we stop learning is the moment that we're perfectly suited for a job that no longer exists. That resonates so much in technology because it's as soon as you think you got it all figured out and that you do know it all, it changes. Just like, you know, ask, ask a Fox Pro developer, you know, um, <laughs> how things are going. You know, they I should register that domain name. Yes. <laughs> ask a Fox Pro developer dot com. Fox Pro is back. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's available. All right. So a few situations where we don't encounter imposter syndrome. And obviously the times when we do, but let's, so let's switch here. The whole point of talking about a problem is to talk about what to do about it. So what are techniques that you can use to deal with when you're encountering imposter syndrome? Say when you're teaching, let's talk about right now, just focus on teaching techniques to use when dealing with imposter syndrome while teaching. I don't have a solution, but what I do is I over prepare, like I prepare and practice and prepare and prepare. And I also try to keep track of uh, questions that are asked during lectures and stuff so that I kind of prepare for those too. But that, that's how I do it. I over-prepare to help myself you know, at least be ready for the material that, are, that I'm teaching, feel a little more comfortable. I think part of that too, part of that preparation, uh, at least in my, what I tend to do is base a lot of the things that I'm teaching in examples. So, you know, if I can demonstrate that something's working and it's doing what I'm saying that it's doing, then it's, it's hard for me to have imposter syndrome because it's right there. Everyone can see it. It's obvious that it's working and that I know what I'm doing. So I think as much as you can base the, the teaching and examples and in things that are concrete and that there's evidence that it is the way that it is, that it, it seriously reduces the amount of imposter syndrome as well. I think it's important too to remember that there are very few real true experts on any given topic. And so, like, you may not have all the answers, but who really does? And I, and I think it helps really to just admit sometimes, like, if someone asks you a question and you don't have the answer, to me, it's worse to pretend like you do and try to, like, BS your way through that conversation than just to say, I don't know that, but I can find that out and get back to you. Or that's a great question. Let's look into it together. But just remembering that, very few people really do have all of the answers. And also that some of the most, you know, quote unquote, successful people or businesses started out with humongous failures to begin with. Like they had, you know, their company totally went bankrupt or something, but they didn't stop. They kept going. They tried it again a different way or whatever it was that worked for them. But that's how they became experts was learning from those failures. So yeah, I would just say like acknowledging that first of all, not everybody has the answers. Very few people do. And then when you yourself don't, don't pretend like you have those answers. Just point out that other people might have solutions or ideas as well. I remind myself that there's, there's probably with every, everything that I'm teaching something, you know, things to people that there's another way that they could do it. There's another approach. There's, there might be two or three different ways. One technique that I like when, when somebody asks a question that I don't know is I'll, I'll go ahead and acknowledge, hey, that's a really great question. And if, if it's something that, uh, that I have no idea, like, hey, I'll research it, I'll get back with you. I, I don't know. I think it's like a job interview. It's the last thing you want to do is, you know, make up what, what you know, observables is, you know, and, and you don't know the answer because they, they, <laughs> they, clearly, they clearly do. But I, I find that by acknowledging people, hey, that's a really good question. 
if there's an opportunity in like in workshops, it's, it's great where it's like, hey, why don't we actually take a look at this really quick? And, and we'll, we'll actually live code it right on the spot and we'll talk about it and, and we'll figure out, well, hey, what does that do and why, what, what's important here and, and then get some interaction back from the group. And I think to me that I, that could be intimidating, but for, for me, I look at it, it's like, wow, this is the best kind of learning because it's more collaborative. Yeah, I was going to say that, that, that relates really well to what I was about to say is that I try to remind myself when I'm teaching that beyond a certain level of competency, my role as a teacher is really more to be like a, a sounding board for people to learn in their own process of learning and self-teaching in the same phenomenon that we talked about on another episode where often when you're working through a problem and you just call over another person and talk to them about it, you figure out the answer. And so a lot of times your role as a teacher isn't necessarily to be some like walking code dictionary or guru. It's really less about you and more about asking questions to get people thinking and working, walking them through where to find the answers and how to debug and, and those kinds of skills. I mean, obviously, if you're like completely incompetent, that's <laughs> that's a problem. But beyond that, that's basically all you're there for. You know, I think one thing too that is helpful is not to go into something feeling like you have to have all of the answers, but just acknowledging what value you can provide for that situation, for that event, whatever it is. But you know, focus more on providing value than providing all of the answers. And I think just having that attitude can help you be a bit more confident because we all have something we can contribute. Even if we aren't full-blown experts on something, we still can contribute something of value. So just focus on that instead. Well, what about uh, social situations then? Sort of when you're teaching, you're in social situations, which this comes up a lot, interacting with other developers and there's talking about stuff you just you don't have a clue about. How do you deal with imposter syndrome then? A lot of times in my case, I'll just be honest about it. Like, I think sometimes it's better to just be honest about what you don't know than pretend that you do know something. Because I think a little bit of humility goes a long way. And ultimately, I don't think that it makes people look down on you as a developer. So I would probably just say in that situation, like, hey, I honestly don't know this and I would love to learn it. And I think that willingness to learn and then allowing someone else to teach you almost makes that relationship even better. So I think that's, in my case, the, the best way to handle it. I love that. I think you can even double down on that because when you ask, start talking and engaging somebody about that thing and actually then ask them to tell you about it, it does two things. One, it, gives, it lets you get educated about a topic. And two, it lets that other person talk about their absolute favorite subject, which is themselves. So... And being interested, about themselves. <laughs> they do. But also, it's a it's a way to actually be interested in somebody because I've been in a social situation, plenty of social situations, and I really want to get to know the other person. But like, especially at a conference, ask them, "Well, tell me about your kids and your wife and your or your husband." And it gets creepy. But tell me about the tech stack that you're working with. Oh, that's not, that's really cool. I've never worked with that. What's that like? And and really engaging on something that you actually have in common can take it away from the creepy level to the really great level and, you know, create a bond there that's it's, it's optional. Another tactic I have seen in these sorts of social situations is to ask somebody to give a talk. That happened to me once. So when you just randomly, I started talking with somebody, told them that they were a great speaker. They randomly asked me to give a talk. It was really weird, but it worked out. I think the other thing that helps me too, Joe, you joked about this, but like saying something that you know, you may not actually say, oh, well, I don't know that, but do you know about this thing? But realizing that, okay, I don't know about this specific technology that they're talking about, but I probably do know something that they don't. I think it helps me to realize that everybody has different things that they need to learn for work or that they like to learn on their own. And so it, just because we have different skill sets doesn't mean that I'm less of a de developer than somebody else. Well, I have a brother who's going to a boot camp right now uh, he's about done and he was here at my house working recently and he he asked a question he asked if I could help him with something and uh they do they're doing react in his boot camp and i have almost no experience in react and so i tried to help him and i could kind of 
I kind of know what he's doing because, you know, I, I have experience in JavaScript and stuff, but that was good for me to realize like, okay, he has a different skill set than I do. I have a different skill set than him, but both of us can, you know, we can both do our jobs and, and that's okay. And I think realizing that helps at least me kind of lessen that imposter syndrome when I am talking with other people. Do you ever wonder how your application gets put onto the devices that it runs on? Whether it's a mobile app being run on an iPhone or Android phone, or whether you're talking about a web app that gets deployed to servers or containers through something like Kubernetes, there's always something going on and understanding how all that stuff goes together can drastically help you figure out how to solve the problems and how to architecture your application better in order to take advantage of how things are set up. You should check out our new podcast, Adventures in DevOps. Adventures in DevOps is a sort of continuation of the Food Fight Show, but is a new podcast. You can find it at adventuresindevopspodcast.com. I really like those uh, blog posts certain people make of uh, things they don't know. It's when they're like industry experts. Uh, who's the Redux guy? Why am I blanking on his name? Dan. Dan Abramov. Dan Abramov. Ab- Abramov. Yeah, there we go. Abramov. Uh, he posted a... That, I don't know, it was a while ago, but he posted, here's all the things that I feel like I should know that I don't know. And that was really nice for me to hear, see somebody. And he mentioned a few things that I did know and um, plenty of things that I wish that I knew as well. So I I really like that as well, that idea of understanding that everybody has things. Everybody's dealing with the same stuff. Everybody has things that they wish that they knew that they don't. So listening to Preston, I was like, so, so Preston is saying that Imposter syndrome is like a really close cousin to FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. They kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, I think I could agree with that. I think I could agree with that. I kind of feel like it shouldn't be called imposter syndrome sometimes so much as like comparison syndrome. Because I think that's really what's going on is that you start comparing yourself to others. So for me, whether it's a social situation or work related, I feel like you need to reframe your thinking a little bit, actually a lot bit, <laughs> like, you know, because you go into it and you, you feel like you're failing at it. But if you can just tweak your thoughts so that they aren't focused on how you're weak at something or failing at something, but instead look at it as a learning opportunity and a chance for you to grow and develop, just take it with that more positive spin. And I think it changes so much of your attitude and how you feel about it. It's kind of like giving yourself permission to be okay with, you know, not knowing everything right now. You can't know everything right now. That's impossible. And this is your opportunity to learn that new whatever it is. So be excited about it and just reframe how you're thinking about it. It's not a failure. You don't need to compare yourself to other people. Compare yourself to you. Yesterday, I didn't know that. Today, I'm learning it, and tomorrow, I will know it. I like that. Okay. Um, what about our third situation where we commonly encounter, let's see, I'm trying to remember what the situations were. Co- oh, conferences. Did we talk about conferences? Yep. I mentioned that. Yeah. How to deal with imposter syndrome when you're at a conference. How do we deal with imposter syndrome when we're at a conference? Don't talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> And don't li- don't listen to the speakers. Uh, definitely do not go to any of the Jesse Sanders presentations. Please. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That will cause <laughs> imposter syndrome. Yeah, like you're here to consume all this value. You're getting inundated with new ideas, new techniques, new tools, new technologies. You're encountering people who this isn't just like you know your work friends who work with you and do basically the same tech stacks, right? Now, people could have radically different tech stacks and radically different backgrounds than you've encountered the people you're sitting with at lunch. How do you deal with those situations and the, all that? Uh, Be eager to learn. Like, go do the workshops. Go, you know, and if you, can't, if, you, if you can't do the workshops, then one of my favorite things, Sam, I'm going to call you out on this. <laughs> when I was at NG Comp, I was just kind of walking around. I think it was day two. I can't remember, but in the hall, I noticed that there was like a gathering of people and Sam was kind of like right in the middle of it and, and different people were talking with each other. But Sam, one of the presenters was giving his time to someone who had come and approached him and asked him a question. And I thought, would I do that? And I, I don't know that I would have, but the more I think about it, I think, why not? You know, like the presenters are there just like anyone else. And 
why shouldn't you feel brave enough to just go and ask them, hey, do you have just five minutes to talk to me about whatever it is you're wondering about? I really liked in your talk when you said this. I'm a little bit curious to know more. Can you teach me? So again, like I think conferences shouldn't be intimidating. It shouldn't be this place where you feel like everybody knows more than you, but look at it as a humongous learning opportunity where you can either do workshops or just go talk to other attendees or even, yes, the presenters. Let them teach you and take it as your chance to grow and learn what it is you're lacking. Yeah, I think when you have too much of an ego in anything like this, it just hurts you. You know, the more you think that you know everything and the more you think you can't learn from someone or a group of people, then the more you're just going to fall behind as a developer. And and, in this industry, it's all about staying on the cutting edge and being able to put your ego aside and learn from people is a great way to stay up to date. I'll say, um, having been a speaker as well as a conference organizer, that most speakers actually really enjoy having people come up to them and ask them questions afterwards. To me personally, I love it. I enjoy fielding questions, talking to people that could be directly related to the talk or just something in general, you know, that they're asking. And I find that most speakers seem to, to relate to that as well. And I, and, and I say this because I see them much like what was being described about Sam, where they're making time to talk with people, answer questions and help them out and, and be of, you know, of service to them. So I think that you know, it, it, although it may be intimidating to, to go up to, to somebody and say, hey, do you have a second? It's really one of the, the best ways to learn and to, to get some very specific knowledge about a problem that you're having and, and get a, an, another opinion on, on, on another approach that might be, might be better. So I, I highly encourage people uh, to, to reach out to speakers. Also with, you know, we've got Angular Denver starting here um, in a couple of days. And we also encourage all the speakers with that to, to spend time in the hallways, to make themselves available, to help answer questions. Because we want to create that kind of environment where people can learn and, and not feel intimidated to go up and ask somebody a question. Yeah, I definitely love fielding questions at conferences. It makes me feel useful. <laughs> I have had conferences where I've been so exhausted that I've had to go hide somewhere and not talk to people. But for the most part, I really, really enjoy that part of it. And I can't speak for all tech communities, but I know that in the Angular community, we try really hard to be welcoming to people coming up and talking to people. I mean, I remember few years ago, getting to meet some of the Angular team way before I was involved with it. And I was super nervous to go up and talk to them. But like, they're just regular folks. And they're really happy to talk to you. And, you know, they have hobbies and things like normal human beings. So I definitely encourage people to to talk to people. So uh, I think that's actually really cool. I like that, Sam. You and I are going to be at a conference next week. This later on this week, right? It's going to be at the same conference. Yeah, many of us will be at the same I think, conference. I think I'm going to ask you a question while you're there. I want to get, I'm going to give you some time, lead time to prep for this. Why Uh-oh. did George Lucas think that Jar Jar Binks was a good idea? So that's, you can make yourself, now you know you can make yourself <laughs> useful with a, with a question to answer. <laughs> I like Star Wars, but I'm not as big of a nerd about it as you and John Papa are. So I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to do some research. Ask Ward Bell. I think Ward actually knows the answer to this question. Ward probably knows the answer to that question, yeah. Ward Bell hates Star Wars. All right. The fourth situation we talked about was new jobs, promotions, changes in your job, and feeling imposter syndrome there. How can you deal with imposter syndrome in that situation? So in my current job, um, when I started four years ago, I was hired as the to do front-end development, and there was only three developers. So... I was kind of thrown to the wolves and and we had to get a lot of stuff done quickly. And I think the thing that helped me most was just being willing to ask questions and knowing that uh, they hired me for a reason. And most of the time, you know, I think at least at the jobs that I've been at, they have been willing to help me. Like they didn't hire me knowing or thinking that I knew everything because I was upfront in my interviews and stuff. And so they were willing to help me. And so being willing to ask questions and not allowing myself to see that as a weakness in myself or that they were going to regret hiring me or something like that has helped a lot. And so just jumping in and being willing to help wherever they may need help 
and ask questions when you don't know something. Research um, the problem before you just ask somebody so that um, you're not pulling them away from what they're doing without having put forth any effort. All those things uh, have helped me. My last boss, when I started there, that job was in the renewable energy sector and I had never done anything in there. And it had this crazy amount of jargon and vocabulary and everything. And my boss was like, listen, anytime you switch to a new domain, just give yourself six months. Like just don't even judge yourself for six months. Do your best, ask a lot of questions, but it's going to take you six months to like get the hang of anything. And that really helped me because I stopped like criticizing myself a lot. And sure enough, like around six months, I started to feel like I understood things. And then when I joined Auth0, I was also really overwhelmed because I'd never worked for an identity company before. And I felt like I was drowning in protocols and identity vocabulary. And I remembered that of giving myself six months and it, it really works. Like it, I think the harder you try to stop feeling like an imposter at a new job, the worse it is. And if you just sort of like cut yourself some slack and do your best and just let the new information sink in over time, I, your brain will asynchronously absorb it over time. And yeah, so I just say give yourself time to adjust. And then celebrate when you have little victories too. I, like, I totally agree with what Sam was saying. You have to be kind to yourself, be patient with yourself. But then when you have successes, you need to really celebrate them. Because if you don't, you're just going to focus too much on the negative or like how you're not, you're not there yet. You know, it's, oh, well, I'm not quite there. But how have you grown? What, what progress have you made? So look back and acknowledge where you were and where you are now. And I think that really helps. Also be a team player. Ask for help. Be vulnerable. Talk to your team and say, hey, this is all new for me too. Let's work through it together and let's make the best of it. And I find that asking people for help, for some reason, builds rapport with other people too. So you, you normally get, you become a little more likable. So when you're in your role and you feel like, I'm not prepared for this role, I'm, I'm, I'm going to mess it up. If you get into, into a good team spirit, I think, I think, it's okay if you mess up. It's okay. They're going to support you because your team is, is also involved with you in the process. All right. So I want to throw one last situation. Imposter syndrome, when you get criticized, whether that's a true, like your boss coming down hard on you for your performance or just random people on the internet, coworkers, whatever it is. Well, how do you deal with the imposter, the imposter syndrome that comes up when you get criticized? I love YouTube comments. Those are the best. They are the best. <laughs> I once heard that YouTube comments are a compelling reason to no longer teach people how to read. Right. <laughs> really great. Uh, I, so with, with uh, our local meetup here, we publish a lot of content from meetups and we'll get some comments that are, that are pretty, they're pretty derogatory. And, and I have to remind people, I'm like, Hey, for most of the people that are that are speaking, it's like this. This is often their their first time speaking, and and that they're not they're not paid. You know, people that that this is just a meetup and and uh, try to remind people about that. It can be, I, I think, a little bit difficult to handle that, especially since it's coming. You know, where people can be more anonymous and and, and they don't have to say it to your face. So I think that's challenging, and so I always try to put a, a positive spin on it. And and sometimes they, even so much where I'm like, hey. There was one, it was uh, how to package custom components. And the guy's like, well, I want to know how to build them. This packaging thing is, you know, we're like, oh, well, here's the video you should watch on the packaging or the the building them. And then you can come back and watch this video on how you would package them. And and just try to be positive about it and and try to still help people and be humble instead of uh, taking offense to it. So I had a recent experience Thinkster sends out uh, three things to send out a newsletter. We try to send out about three a week. We got, I don't know, 120, 130,000 people that get the email. And on Friday nights, I send this email about emotional health, right? I try to keep it somewhat developer focused, but it's basically about a non, non-development specific topic. And uh, two weeks ago, one mostly when people reply, they're like, oh, thank you. That was cool. That sort of thing. One person replied and said, what is this stream of consciousness crap? blah, blah, blah. There was some fill in the blanks I don't want to repeat over the air. And then it was, 
you're just bad at writing. You just suck at writing and that's okay. Most people do. Go back to what you're good at, right? That was the, that was the critical feedback. So instantly, of course, I had the automatic uh, imposter syndrome set right in. Well, I, I suck at what I'm doing and nobody likes what I'm doing and I, I'm wasting my time and blah, blah, blah. Then, of course, I also wanted to get defensive. But I, I sat for a, really, a while and I think this is another useful thing, which was I said to myself, you know what? I enjoy more our, to the opportunity to do something and practice it and get better than I do just doing the things that I'm good at. It's so much better in life to actually see progress and have an opportunity. And I want to practice my writing. So I practice, I'm, that's what I'm doing. I'm actually practicing my writing. I'm having the opportunity to get better. And, and I can look at if that person had actually given me any concrete critical feedback. I could have looked at that and said, oh, maybe I can improve in this area. That is at least one thing to, th- to keep in mind when you are getting criticism and you're feeling that imposter syndrome is no matter whether or not you are just beginning in a topic or an area or you are have been doing it for a long time and then that's when it's worse is when you i think when you've been doing something for a while and then somebody comes along and says oh this thing that you think you're good at you actually suck at it let me tell you why you suck at that thing and then just stop and say well i can always improve there's nothing in life i'm actually going to and ever be truly perfect at Kind of a couple things that come to mind when you say that, Joan. First of all, I have to give you credit because one thing that I really admire about you and that you did really well with those emails is that you laugh it off. You don't take it personal. I mean, you know, it sounds like you did at first initially, but you kind of stood back from the situation. You gave it some time without reacting in the moment and you learned to laugh at it. And I'm terrible at that. Like I never laugh at myself. I'm, I hold myself to such a high standard, but it, I think it's really important to do in these situations. Just learn to laugh and be okay with making a mistake. You know, everybody does it. And then another thing that came to mind when you were talking is this idea of external validation. Do we really need other people to validate who we are and the importance that we have in our given role? And I think that's probably one of the most difficult things to do in a career situation or even personally, but just to find your internal sense of accomplishment and self. But if you can do that, then it doesn't matter what other people are saying to you. And it just rolls off so much more easily. So, you know, make that a a challenge for yourself. Set out to really find that internal validation of I am good enough. Even if I'm not the best at this, I am good enough. While someone was talking, I was thinking about a talk at NGConf this year uh, by Chloe Condon. I think that's how you say her last name. Uh, But she did the talk on how she could use the Internet of Things to send herself a text or a call to get out of awkward situations. And I remember thinking, oh, that was awesome. That was really cool. I want to try doing stuff like that. And then at the same time, all of a sudden, I started seeing some stuff on Twitter about how some people were complaining about her talk and and all this stuff. And um, it made me realize that you're always going to have some people who dislike what you do, no matter what it is. But there's also going to be a lot of people. um, And I saw a lot of people on Twitter reach out to her and say, hey, don't worry about that. I thought it was really cool. I liked it. And so you can't make everybody happy. If the criticism that you receive is something that you can actually build on, then I think it's important to take that and say, okay, you know, I can, I can learn from this. If it's just people being rude, then I think uh, it can be hard, but the best way is to just throw it out and say, well, you know, apparently they can't be happy about anything or whatever, you know, just ignore it. But trying to, to take legitimate criticism and uh, applying that to your life is important. But a lot of times I think, especially on the internet, the criticism that we get is just people who like to, I don't know, like to argue. And and so you can just let that go. Remember there are trolls, right? The trolls of the internet. Yeah, I always try to judge the criticism in proportion to the relationship I have to the person. Like, I mean, I'll always try to see if there's some germ of truth in it. But yeah, I'm going to take criticism much more seriously from a boss or a coworker that I trust or a, you know, relationship or something like that than strangers on the internet. Right. Yeah, I think that's really important. Sorry, uh, real quick. I got in a, like a Twitter argument a few years ago with someone, which is always a bad idea. Don't do it. But um, I tweeted something about basketball, about Utah State basketball or something. I'm a big basketball fan. 
graduated from Utah State. And I tweeted something and someone who wrote about the team for the, the school paper saw it and he disagreed with me and he told me, you know, you should just watch more basketball. You, you apparently don't watch enough basketball. And I showed it to my wife and, and she laughed because I watch every Utah Jazz game. There's 82 regular season games. I watch all 82 of those. I watch 20 high school games a year that my brothers play in. I watch a handful of college games. And I, I told my wife, I was like, well, this guy thinks I should watch more basketball. What do you think? And, and she laughed. But people, they don't know you. And so they'll, they'll throw criticism at you. And they really have no idea who you are or what you put into it. And so in a lot of cases, you can just just ignore it because like Sam said, if they know you, then they can give you good criticism. If they don't know you, then they probably can't give you good enough criticism to, to help you out. Right. Uh, any final thoughts here before we wrap up? I would just say, like, I think imposter syndrome really comes down to this emotion of fear, fear of failure, the fear of not being good enough. But I know that for myself, the things that have brought me the greatest success and the most happiness were the times when I somehow found the, the, the courage to do something that was really scary. So I would just say, you know, do what you can to get through that fear and just do something that scares you. And it's amazing what can come out of that. I think it's, you know, we, as we've all shared here today is that we're, we all experience imposter syndrome at some level in, in, in certain situations. And I think it's, it's best to keep in mind that it's going to come up and, and Hey, how do I want to deal with it? And, and also I, I think back to this thing, I, I think I just saw it this morning and said, a road without obstacles is a, is a road not worth traveling. Right. And that if it was easy and, and there wasn't any anxiety, then there would be, there wasn't any obstacle that, that it wouldn't be as worthwhile in, in doing it and spending our time and, and uh, making this happen. And so I think enjoy the journey of it and uh, just, you know, be aware of it and, and know that fear and, and do it anyway. I think also um, we've talked a lot about how we feel imposter syndrome, but because we've all felt it before, I think it's also important for us to help other people overcome their feelings of imposter syndrome. And we can do that just by, you know, giving words of encouragement to people. When, when I was asked by Brooke and Joe to be on the first episode that I was on of this podcast, I was like, I don't know why they're asking me to be on this podcast. I, I have not enough experience to, to really pitch in. And then we got in the, the, uh, call we're recording the episode and I didn't say anything for like the first five or 10 minutes. And I think it was Luis. He sent a, a little chat message and he said, Hey, we haven't heard from you yet. We want to hear from you. And that helped a lot. And so I think as we're out and we're talking with people, just giving them encouragement will help them overcome imposter syndrome. And hopefully, you know, it'll just pass on like that. But I think it's up to us to help other people overcome it as well. That's an awesome thought, Preston. Love that, helping other people overcome their imposter syndrome. And I think it begins with awareness. Like, share that you feel it and make them aware that it exists. And say, hey, this is something that you're going to face. I don't have the solution, and I don't. I don't have the solution for it. I just know that it exists so that we can prepare to face it when it comes. So I think awareness is something that we could do. Awesome. Developers are people just like us, and a lot of times they have really, really interesting stories about how they got into a programming language, out of a programming language, how they got into programming in the first place. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that have a degree in music or have some affinity for music, or maybe they have a degree in something else like theater, and then they wound up getting into programming for other reasons. I actually used to work with a whole team of people that all had law degrees that wrote code. It's just interesting to me how people have come along in their careers as developers. So we have a show for you. If you're into Angular, go check out myangularstory.com. All right. Well, let's uh, finish up with a fun question to go around. Let's have everybody mention one thing, technology. Let's try to keep it somewhat development type focused that they want to learn that they almost feel embarrassed to say that they haven't learned this yet. If, if you can find something, you're, you'd basically be embarrassed to admit that you haven't learned this yet and, and, and name that off. I'm going to lead off with saying Jest. I've done essentially no work with the Jest unit testing tool, and I, I talk and teach a ton about unit testing. And so it's a common question that comes up, and I, and I have to keep saying, 
I, I throw my, my shoulders up and shrug and say, I don't know. So Jess, that's, that's the one for me that I'm almost embarrassed to say, I just don't know Jess. Mine is a Webpack. I should know Webpack, but, and I can use it, but like I'm, I have no idea how to like do it myself. So if I have to go in and like change the options, I'm just like totally lost. So I need to learn that. But yeah, that's a big one for me. Imposter syndrome wise, like just not knowing Webpack at all. I would say for me, it's like things related to CSS and design. Like I get by, but I couldn't list off for you like the options for Flexbox. I couldn't write Flexbox or CSS grids from scratch. I basically just get by with whatever CSS I've learned over the years. And I'm like constantly embarrassed by it. And I try really hard to, I've like watched a bunch of courses and I just don't like CSS. I don't like doing that stuff. And so it never sticks for me, but it's, it's been a problem. And I've done a lot of enterprise jobs that use like bootstrap and foundation. And so I haven't really had, I haven't been forced to learn it. So that's a big one for me. I was going to say that too, Sam. I was going to say Flexbox and just. CSS. Anything CSS is, 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 it's embarrassing. It's something that we all have to do a little bit of, but usually it's like, okay, once it kind of gets done in a project, we're kind of done with it for a while. And I think I've also been guilty that, that I've had projects where we've had a designer go ahead and slice uh, PDFs down to HTML and CSS for us. And so we don't really, I, the team that I was on it, but we didn't really have to know CSS that well, just minor modifications. So I, I, I'm going to go pound hashtag me too uh, on, the, on the CSS. Cool. Who hasn't gone with theirs? Yeah, I'll go with mine real quick. Every now and then I talk to somebody and they bring up like, you know, how a website actually works and how like when a request is made, how stuff comes to the browser. And I have really no idea how any of that works. I've been doing web development for like five years. So I feel like I should know that, <laughs> but I have no idea how it works. So yeah. It's just all magic. I don't know. It just works. You put in the URL and it just works. That's mostly been my answer, but I'd like to actually learn a little bit more about that. There are little gremlins that run the information back and forth. So do, do I have to go on record saying that I don't know about regular expressions? <laughs> Luis, do you know what happens when you have a problem and you solve it using regular expressions? No, I don't. <laughs> now so you have two. This is, this is what happens when you, if you have a problem and you solve it with regular expressions, now you have two problems. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stealing my joke. <laughs> I was stealing your joke, Jesse. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. The link to that. There's a really good XKCD comic about regular expressions that we should put in the show notes. Yeah, I always, I always shrug it off. I was like, regular expression. Now that's not for humans. But in reality, is that I, I know I should know more about regular expressions, but I don't. Yeah, I feel, I feel, yeah, I feel, yeah. And we got the link in the show notes. Cool. All right. So is that everybody? We covered everybody? All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for being on the episode. This was a fun episode. I really like this. And uh, thanks, for everybody, for listening. We'll be back next time with another episode. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Yes. Adios. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.